Hello and welcome to Let's Read The Gambler by Theodore Dostoevsky. This is an audio presentation of the novella with occasional clarifying commentary from me, the reader. Now, if you want to jump straight to the action, feel free to skip ahead to the next video in this playlist. To access the playlist itself, check out the video description below. Otherwise, stick around, and I'll explain the nature of this project a bit further, while providing some background material on the book. The basic purpose of this Let's Read is to make the literature as accessible as it can be in an audio format. Typically, when you read classical literature in print, you have a number of advantages at your disposal. An introduction from a literary scholar, notes containing background information that might be lost on a modern audience, time to absorb complications in the text, and so on. In a conventional audiobook, by contrast, you get simply the spoken text rolling on. But not here. With this project, I will read through the entirety of the book with you, but I will retain the license to add comments where I think it may be helpful to a general audience. In just a moment, I will provide some introductory background information on the novella. When completed, this Let's Read will also contain some concluding thoughts on the book, but it will also have some notes sprinkled throughout the reading, simply to clarify points that the average listener could easily miss. I will do my best to keep a light hand and to allow the text to stand on its own. But there will be cases where it will be useful to identify references or to sum up events, and so you will be hearing my comments every so often to flesh out the full picture of Dostoevsky's work. I will reserve my own analysis and reactions to the text for the final video of this sequence. When I do have embedded comments in the text, they will virtually always appear at the end of a chapter, in order to avoid breaking up the flow of the narrative. There will be other occasions where I will provide clarifying comments visually on the screen. In particular, dialogue in The Gambler often slips into French and sometimes into German. On these occasions I will keep the text flowing, but the translation will be available to you if you keep your eyes open. Now, currently, you are viewing this project as part of a YouTube playlist, and I will start making these videos available to the public once I'm a little over a third of the way through the recording. When completed, I will likely assemble all the parts of this playlist into a single video. If you prefer to listen in that format, the video description below may show you how to do so. Otherwise, feel free to stick around with this playlist. If you are keeping it here, our next item of business is an introduction to the novella itself. First off, The Gambler is in the public domain. The version we will be reading has been translated by Constance Garnett, and it appears in a volume published by William Heinemann Limited, entitled The Gambler and Other Stories, which is available for download at archive.org. In this format, it is 132 pages long. The Gambler is a novella written under extraordinary duress. In the autumn of 1866, Dostoevsky had to interrupt the serial publication of Crime and Punishment in order to meet the approaching deadline of an astonishingly draconian contract. The prior year, in straitened circumstances, he had signed an agreement with a publisher named Stelovsky, according to which the author would need to produce a novella by November 1, 1866, or else hand over the rights to all of his future works with no payment for nine years. In the meantime, he had secured another contract with advance payment for Crime and Punishment, Dostoevsky thus had to work on two major undertakings at once. But while Crime and Punishment was well underway by the middle of 1866, writing for The Gambler did not begin until that October. Somehow he managed to turn around the novella in a month, 
just beating the deadline and avoiding a form of literary slavery. This naturally invites us to ask why the man would have been reduced to signing such a contract in the first place. Part of his desperation for money had to do with bad luck. His brother had recently died, leaving him with a mountain of debt to manage, and the family of his recently deceased wife created an additional strain on his finances. But another cause of his financial difficulties was entirely self-inflicted. That's right, Fyodor Dostoevsky was himself a gambler. At the time of writing, the two most serious bouts with gambling had occurred abroad, once in 1863 and again in 1865, and on each occasion in Wiesbaden, Germany. On the former occasion, he had a moment of good fortune before his luck turned sour and he lost half his winnings. That was the origin of his addiction. The latter occasion was disastrous. He swiftly lost his last penny at the roulette tables and thus wound up incurring the wrath of the hotel staff, who ceased to provide him with meals, and living in fear of arrest by the police. Only through the charity of others was he able to return to Russia. There was another common thread uniting those two trips abroad. On each occasion, Dostoevsky was in the company of a younger woman by the name of Apollinaria Suslova. Suslova was a strong, free-thinking intellectual who had a brief moment of attraction to the middle-aged author. But she would also treat him terribly, and Dostoevsky ultimately loved her intensely and unsuccessfully, and in the end very much against his own better judgment. What developed was a sort of love-hate relationship that poisoned his social life until she disappeared from his orbit altogether. Both of these toxic elements, gambling addiction and an intense love-hate relationship, appear in the pages of The Gambler. But there is another detail from the novella's historical context that has a much happier flavor. When he started writing during that fateful October of 1866, he desperately needed someone to take dictation in order to speed up the process. The young woman who filled the vacancy would become the great love of his life, without whom his later works probably could not have been written. Her name would become Anna Grigorievna Dostoevsky. While widely regarded as one of Dostoevsky's better novellas, The Gambler lacks many of the features that we associate with his great works. It is not a broodingly metaphysical tale that contemplates ultimate issues and man's place in the world. Neither murder nor suicide find a place in these pages, and the existence of God is never even brought up. On the other hand, it does showcase the author's characteristic psychological acuity, and it displays many of the author's ideas about the relations between different national types, the relations between men and women, and the relation between a man and his own ego. And while the story does have autobiographical inspiration, as just noted, it is not merely a fictionalization of his own experiences. The imaginative world of his novella has its own independent trajectory and pursues independent themes, including man's capacity for self-destructive mania, both in affairs of the heart and elsewhere. The narrative is delivered through the diary of a young man. The man is employed as a tutor to the children of a Russian general, who is currently staying abroad in a town named Roulettenburg, which we are to imagine is located in Germany. The town is apparently a tourist destination for travelers of all nationalities, and we encounter several of them in the course of the novella. Most notably, the plot features a man and a woman from France. The French woman is the great love interest of the general and is the primary reason he is staying in Roulettenburg, while the French men has been engaged in some mysterious business dealings with the general in the past. 
Another member of their party is the general's stepdaughter, with whom the narrator is deeply infatuated. The affairs of these four figures are complicated and interrelated, but the narrator is not immediately privy to them, and much of the plot involves his attempt to unravel the mysteries surrounding them. Naturally, as the casino is the dominant attraction of the town, the roulette wheel will influence the fate of everyone there, including that of the narrator himself. Along the way, we get a sense of who our narrator is and how he views the world. He is not as striking a figure as the most notorious of Dostoevsky's narrators, the underground man, but he is also not a simple character, and not everything he says should be taken at face value. As with the underground man, we do have to consider his reactions to events with at least some skepticism. I will say more on this in my concluding comments as I discuss the thematic elements of the book. The novella comprises seventeen chapters, and it is composed of entries in the narrator's diary. However, it is not the case that each chapter is a separate entry. As I read the tale, there are six separate entries in the diary, as listed on your screen. The breaks in entries do not always correspond to breaks in the chronology. In some cases, the chronology between two separate entries is continuous. At one point, there is a chronological break within a single entry, and the narrative mechanism occasionally gives rise to mysteries for careful readers. For instance, how it is that the man is able to scribble all of chapters 6 through 12 into his diary during the window of time the plot affords him to do so strains the imagination. But we may grant Dostoevsky some creative license here. For a short work, the plot of The Gambler is surprisingly complicated, and so I will be helping out as we go along. But one important thing to get straight is the cast of characters, and so I am providing a dramatis personae here. It may be worth noting that Russian names have three components. A first name, a surname, and a patronymic between them, which itself includes the father's first name and then a suffix of vich or ovna, depending upon the person's sex. So our author's name is Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoevsky, as his father's name was Mikhail. In a formal mode of address, one would use the first name and patronymic, such as Fyodor Mikhailovich. In an informal mode, one would use the first name alone or a diminutive, such as Fyodor or Fedya. In the case of the gambler, we rarely have the complete name of any of our Russian characters. So our protagonist is Alexei Ivanovich. We never do learn his surname. The Russian head of the household is the general, who is unnamed throughout most of the book, although we do get a hint late on that his surname is Sagoyansky. His sister plays a minor role in the novella. Her name is Maria Filipovna. More important is Polina, his stepdaughter, or Praskovia Alexandrovna, in the formal mode of address. As noted earlier, she is the object of the narrator's feverish affection. Polina is a young woman, but the general's two biological children by his deceased wife are much younger. Misha and Nadia are seen and not heard in the novella. Their nurse, Fedosia, also attends to the general. The other Russian who dominates the stage is the general's wealthy aunt. Her name is Antonida Vasilyevna Tarasyevichev, but she is referred to simply as Granny. She carries in her wake a handful of servants, most notably Potapich, her butler, and Marfa, her maid. 
The European contingent is dominated by the French duo mentioned earlier. The man's name is Monsieur de Gru, sometimes referred to as the Marquis, although his background, along with his prior dealings with the general, is shrouded in some mystery. The young French woman goes by the name Mademoiselle Blanche de Comanges. From the beginning she has the general in her back pocket. An older woman in their group is identified as her mother, Madame de Comanges. The other notable European in the story is a wealthy Englishman named Mr. Astley. He is of an age with our protagonist, and he serves as an anchor of sanity and virtue in the novella. A brief but important role is also played by a middle-aged Prussian couple, the Baron and Baroness Bömerhelm, who are visiting the town. There are many other bit players in the novella, only two of whom I will mention here. One of them is a young Prince Nilski, who occupies the fringes of the party in Roulettenberg, and who has a minor amorous connection with Mademoiselle Blanche. Late on there is a similar love interest, a French officer by the name of Albert. And that, I think, is more than enough to start with. I'll be popping in briefly here and there with some clarifying commentary as we go forward, and I'll have my say on the novella in my concluding comments. But now it is time to let the story itself unfold. We shall do so next as we begin The Gambler. <laughs> 